All right. Um, so what we've been talking about so far has been trying to understand mechanisms of transport. So we've made the distinction between the first part of the class, uh, section two, where we talk about multiphase flow and transport. So how stuff gets into uh, the pore space in the first uh, couple of months, uh, driven by gravity and arrested by Capri forces, uh, and then sits there. So then for us, the question is, once it's uh, in place, uh, what happens to that material? And so I guess our view of things has been that if it's a, a Dean apple that sits below the water table, then you have some form of a, a, a chimney that develops, some form of, uh, depending on the uh, heterogeneity, some sequence of little ledges of things that will sit on top of uh, capri barriers and arrange some distribution in the subsurface. And then with this stuff in place, uh, we know enough about permeabilities and Darcy's law to be able to calculate in an approximate way if the water table is inclined to be able to evaluate advective velocities. And so if we know what advective velocities are, we can say something about how, uh, in our own idealization, with this kind of as a, as a source region, how we are able to make that describe, in our simplest form, taking this reservoir, basically this would be the reservoir as a, a core plug, is the easiest way for us to think about it. And if we do that, then we can figure out from having this continuous source upstream or a non-continuous source upstream, they have different forms as you'll remember, then this describes exactly what will happen in terms of transport going downstream, which in space would look something like this. And we now know it's not completely true, but we know that the length traveled Velocity is equal to length over time, so length is equal to the product of velocity and time. That's right, yeah. So length over time times time is just length. And not true in all cases, but it'll give us a profile that looks like this. It looks like this because around this front, we'd expect to see these fingers of the uh, not immiscible transport, but fingers of miscible transport, mixed transport, where it takes these, oh, it's exploding on me, where it takes these fast paths, where these individual fingers, if you like, would basically be stringers that would be, would have higher velocities than the material around it. And so that's the reason that we get this spreading. We know something about uh, dispersion, uh, and we know that the behavior when this is equal to, when there's no dispersion in the system, it will be just plug flow. And that when dispersion is uh, not, or greater than zero, not equal to zero, I guess, be greater than zero, it will tend to look like this. And we also know at some compliance location, we'll kind of get the inverse of this uh, plot. I should always label these things as C over S relative concentrations, relative concentrations, whoops. And if this is one, then again, you expect this to be not canted over, being vertical, I think, here. And this time here, we can also calculate in an approximate way from, from this, that the time is equal to length over velocity. Time lag is equal to length over advective velocity. And it has to be advective velocity. And so we know about this. Uh, we also know a little about the fact that this isn't quite true, but this can be offset. And it can be offset in that if we look at this uh, response here, then if we plot it, for instance, as a function of it could be time, as we've done here, or it could be pore volumes. If you recall, we use that. 
Uh, you can find out yourself what that is. A relative concentration, C over C0. And we know that this pore volume would be equal to 1. It would be for a Peclet number of infinity. And Peclet number is a advective velocity, a length traveled, divided by a dispersion magnitude. Uh, and if Peclet number is, in this case, it's equal to infinity, it's this vertical line. And if it's not equal to infinity, then it might be flatter than this. Or indeed, in some cases, it would actually arrive so that this point, this 50% point here, is nowhere near this uh, TR relative uh, pore volumes being equal to 1. And so we've always kind of described this in physical terms of what's going on. Pore volume equal to 1 means that you've physically displaced all of the fluid that was started off in the pores so that this new fluid that you started pushing in is now coming out. So it's reached here, and therefore the concentration instantly goes up to 1 because this shock front arrives there. Uh, that's true if uh, the, the Peclet number is very large, but if it's progressively smaller, and for instance, if the Peclet number is equal to 1, we can show that it actually is not really related to this half concentration, poor volume 1 coordinate at all. And that's because advective behavior has nothing to do with its outcome. It's purely driven by diffusion. It's the behavior as if you put ink in water and it's spreading out in water, not by the velocity of the flow uh, that's carrying it downstream, but it's just meandering downstream by molecular diffusion. That, that's all. Um, someone might remind me what pore volumes is, I guess. Um, is it velocity times length? Yeah, where is it? I'll just look it up. So, does someone want to shout it out if you have it? I don't have it at my fingertips, but we'll use it today. Probably the concept is right here. Velocity times time over length. Advective velocity times time over length. This, this parameter here. And the, the figure we just drew, by the way, is this. So we've, we've seen this. We've seen it here, and we've also seen it in Fetter here, this, this one here. And so these are key understandings for us that have been predicated on the idea of conservative transport. Um, and so we're going to take it the next step now and look at non-conservative transport. So this is just the, the preamble to that. So uh, pore volumes is velocity time times time over length. So, so this is uh, advective velocity times time over length. Velocity times time is the length. The length over length is non-dimensional. So basically this is saying how far it's gone in, the pulse has gone in a given time. And when it's equal to the length, then it's equal to, to 1. So so that's kind of the, the underpinnings from what we've talked about so far. So everything we've talked about, all the fluid that gets dissolved from this uh, hot zone upstream um, remains in solution. Uh, that's, by definition, the idea of conservative transport. But when we talk about uh, retardation and attenuation, um, this refers to the case where no longer does the stuff that starts off in solution get uh, retained there. There's a very subtle difference between these. And uh, retardation means typically that it's uh, sorbed onto the grains. And the implication of that is it's reversible. So you have a concentration which is higher than pure water. It gets sorbed onto the grains because it's attracted to the, the mineral, minerals that are there. As soon as you then flush it with fresh water, you have the reverse behavior that it would desorb and go into the water. So it's reversible. And so sorption is often uh, <coughs> thought of as reversible. As opposed to attenuation, which often refers to a chemical reaction, maybe, where you have a transformation of fluid components that are in the aqueous phase, and they become solid compounds in the the solid phase, and therefore they're, they're both removed from the dissolved components, the aqueous component, and they're attached to the substrate, the rocks which aren't moving. 
And so retardation attenuation is, is driven by processes that take stuff out of the aqueous phase and put it onto the, the solid substrate. And therefore, it's lost to the fluid phase. And since we're always talking about concentrations in terms of what's in the water, not in the rock, then it reduces the concentrations that are typically in the water. And so we'll talk about that. And to be, to be able to understand that, we need to know a little bit about uh, sorption and isotherms. Isotherms are just uh, ways of describing the magnitude of sorption, how we might measure that, and how we might represent that behavior in uh, fractured rock. So, so we need everything that we've done so far to be able to, to, be able to take this next step. Um, and it turns out to be relatively straightforward, I think. Um, and that is that these are the two cases that we've just uh, that we've talked about. We just talked about the top one, uh, sorry, the bottom one, I guess, right? This we describe behavior by this advection diffusion equation, an advective term, which is the mass transport by the bulk motion of the water, the mixing that's due to dispersion or diffusion. They both look the same, and accumulation at some location downstream when uh, the agents that transport stuff into the bucket uh, are more going in than going out, in which case it accumulates, or more going out than comes in, in which case it's depleted. So a, a negative accumulation, if you like. So that's physically what this uh, expression means. And if we apply it to a, a case where we have an upstream uh, concentration turned on at time t0, then if you take a snapshot along the length of the aquifers we've just drawn, then the concentration distribution would be this. So by definition, this is a case where uh, dispersion is uh, greater than zero, and plug flow when it's uh, equal to zero. If it happens to be a source that is just turned on and then turned off, so in other words, injecting some aqueous mixed fluid into the subsurface and then doing nothing after that and allowing the natural gradients to take it downstream, then the profile would be this. If there's no dispersion, it would look like this. It would exactly mirror this behavior here. But if there is dispersion, it would be um, muted. So it would be spread out, and the height of the, um, the peak would be, be muted. And so that's our, our picture of exactly what's going on. And so what we'd like to do is be able to use these same expressions. And what we will do is use these same expressions to represent the behavior where we have sorption. And we could, well, we could probably guess now what it might look like, but I don't think we need to do that because I guess we won't have to wait too long to figure out exactly what's going on. So the things that we're talking about would be uh, straightforward uh, things like adsorption and desorption. So in other words, when uh, the material in water uh, gets attracted to mineral grains, and such as organic solvents, which is what we're talking about primarily in this class, and it gets sorbed onto the organic matter and is lost. It also includes things like uh, reactions, where you get transformations uh, that would move material from the dissolved phase and put it in the solid phase. It could be dissolution of precipitation. I guess we're really talking about precipitation, precipitates, which are similar to sorption, but these would just be physical chemical compounds which would be um, precipitated onto minerals and other forms of, of reactions or even uh, biological reactions. They all will start looking, looking the same. And so we're not so worried exactly as to what the chemistry of these things are. But the one critical behavior that we need to accommodate is that the, the assumption usually is that it's an equilibrium reaction. And that is that it, it, the reaction or the sorption takes place quickly enough that it can be thought of as instantly. And so, in other words, if you have a beaker with some grains of, um, could be activated carbon, organics in, uh, solid organics in an aquifer, or it could be um, uh, quartz representing uh, the grains of sand in an aquifer. And the idea is that if you put uh, an aqueous solution in it, all of a sudden the concentration that goes onto the solid, so the mass that is absorbed onto the solid, what we'll call C star, all of a sudden increases up to some magnitude and then stays at that magnitude. So it reaches some equilibrium. And the, the key issue, I guess, is not only that it gets up to some equilibrium value and stops that there for a given aqueous concentration. If you double the aqueous concentrations, then the concentration that gets absorbed onto the, the solid would be uh, doubled. And so this would be double that, but that's not 
are prime concern. The most important thing is that this time that it takes to get to this equilibrium behavior is short, short compared to whatever the, the transport time is through the system. So in other words, it's moving slowly enough through the system that it has a chance to be able to reach equilibrium as, as it goes through that, you, that small packet of uh, aquifer. And so that's our, the, the fundamental requirement that uh, we're interested in. And so it comes in two flavors, if you like, adsorption and absorption, right? with a D and with a B. And there are subtle differences between them. Again, it's a bit like our behavior when we talked about molecular diffusion and um, mechanical mixing, is that they physically look like a diffusive process. They're completely different. One is these flow paths that diverge as it goes downstream, so that when you look at the concentration distribution downstream, it's this bell curve. The other one is that Brownian motion takes the ink drop and it allows it to spread out just by trying to reduce the magnitude of the concentration. But the end point is that they both look like this um, this uh, bell curve in terms of those two processes. But they're spreading out for two very different reasons if you look at concentration versus location. And so adsorption and absorption are different in that adsorption means that if you take a, a particle, I suppose, I guess the uh, description of it would be. If you take a particle and you could draw um, a concentration profile across this particle and so it would look like this is radius I guess from the middle. This would be the edge and this would be the edge. If you looked at uh, adsorption, which is this first one, then the concentration profile would basically look like this. It would attach itself only to the edge of the particle. It would be up at some concentration C over C0, and it would look like this. So this would be adsorption. If you look at absorption, the second one, then what it is is that the, the solute that's present at the boundary slowly attempts to diffuse into the interior of this particle. And so initially it would look like this, but over time it would look progressively uh, like this, so that at some stage within this particle, this would be uniform. So this is um, absorption, and the stuff on the outside, if I just do this vertical line, would be adsorption. So, But the, the net effect in either case is that both of them, if they're attaching uh, material from the aqueous phase onto the solid means it's lost to the fluid. And so it has to reduce the, uh, the magnitude of the concentrations in the, uh, in the fluid. And so the way of dealing with this is actually pretty straightforward. Um, we said that this advection diffusion equation is merely a statement of two things, right? This is uh, <coughs> accumulation. And that has to equal mass in minus mass out. And so it's, it's really just a, a mass balance, only in the water. And so if you think that we would uh, remove an extra amount of mass, not by looking at, say, you know, obviously, if you have a bucket and you have more going in than comes out, by definition, you get net, net accumulation. So this is m dot in. I'm making it more complicated than it means, needs to be, I think. m dot out. If these aren't exactly equal to each other, then you mass accumulate, by definition. And so you could think of this as being the amount that goes out from the cell, but also you could think about this component not physically going out of the cell, but being attached onto the solid and therefore being removed from the water mainly by, say, if it, um, if it plated the sides of this bucket, all of a sudden it would be removed. And this term would be this. So this is the, the sorption term, if you like. You could think of a term that changes concentration. So it has the same units as this accumulation term. It's saying the concentration of aqueous components uh, dissolved in water would be changing in some way within that cell. Uh, and if that's the case, this it could be due to reactions, which we won't talk about. Or it could be due to sorption, which is they, they both look the same. So these kind of look the same. They both have the same effect, uh, 
that they would net remove material from the aqueous uh, component and attach it so it can't go anywhere. And this is described in this term in terms of this sorption term. It's a density of the aquifer, so I guess the terms are defined here. The bulk density of the aquifer, this is the volumetric moisture content. So you'll remember that the, the maximum value of this volumetric moisture content can be the porosity. It's, I guess, the volume of uh, water divided by the total volume of the aquifer. If all the voids are filled with water, then the volume of water has to be the volume of voids. And this is then the volume of voids divided by the total aquifer volume, which is, by definition, is just porosity. And this is what we referred to before as the concentration that's present on the solid, that's sorbed onto the solid or absor absorbed into the solid. And again, with this idea that the, it occurs very quickly. And so what we want to do is we'd like to be able to write this equation not in terms of uh, aqueous concentrations which occur here and here and here, which are mixed with these solid concentrations, because we'd like to have one equation to solve. And so what we need to do is be able to relate uh, aqueous concentrations to this solid concentration, or, or vice versa, really. And so the way of doing that is very straightforward. Uh, you, you've certainly seen it before in your other life, in this life, I guess, uh, in this thermodynamic quantity. And it's an isotherm. And so the, the basic definition of an isotherm is if you take... Um, a beaker that you fill with uh, part of your aquifer. And if you put in some material that has some particular uh, liquid concentration, and you know what that liquid concentration is, and if you measure the amount of change in that concentration when it comes in equilibrium within the beaker, either by weighing the solid with the new component onto it, which is not very easy to do, or by calculating the amount of concentration change in the liquid, the only place where it could have gone is the solid, which is really the way that you do it, then if you apply a given concentration and you measure a concentration in the solid, then you have a single point. So you put concentration within the beaker, some aqueous concentration, you measure how the concentration on the solid changes, and so you have two data points that collide to give you one point. If you double the concentration and do it again, you end up with another data point, and if you put a line through those, you end up with some kind of so-called isotherm. And all an isotherm is doing is allowing you to be able to link uh, two components. It's allowing you to link the solid concentration with the um, liquid concentration. And so I guess on this, this is liquid concentration and solid concentration. You have a straight line that uh, relates those. If you give it a gradient where you could take a change in concentration and a change in the solid concentration, you have uh, a ratio of two terms. If they happen to all be along a straight line, then this ratio of dc to tc star is constant and doesn't change. And so if we want to get this property that we talked about before that turns up in this expression, which is this expression here, we can just rewrite this out as this. And it's no different from writing it out in slightly longhand form as this. And multiplying both top and bottom by the change in concentration in the liquid. So now we have a term which is only written in terms of concentration, which is like this, whoops, oh, which is like this term here and this term here, and is exactly identical to this term here. It's written in terms of aqueous concentration. And it's defined in terms of something that we know, which is the ratio of these two, two terms. And if we have a, a linear isotherm, it's just the slope of this curve that we, we, we drew here. And so basically the idea is to be able to replace this um, component behavior that we have in this expression in terms of a solid concentration with uh, a liquid concentration <coughs> and a term which is a function of a, a material property. And the material property is just done by doing a, a sorption experiment to be able to measure this. And it turns out that this property that we have here is called the distribution co coefficient. I don't know if it's written on that page. Well, I can write it out. 
distribution coefficient. And it's a material property that we can use to be able to describe the, the behavior of our system. Uh, and so it depends how our uh, isotherm, sorption isotherm looks. The simplest ones would be uh, a linear isotherm, which is the top one that's shown here. They come in a variety of uh, flavors, three flavors really, I suppose. One would be a, a linear isotherm, which is just a straight line between the, the two concentrations of the solid and the liquid. It's given by just the ratio of those two. The, uh, one is called a, a Freundlich isotherm, which is just a power law, which is just the, the linkage between the aqueous concentration raised to some power. Depending on whether that power is greater than one or less than one, it gives it different curvatures. It doesn't necessarily asymptote to anything. Uh, but it's a useful mathematical expression. Or perhaps one of the most widely used in many areas is uh, the Langmuir isotherm. And so Langmuir isotherm in a physical way just says that you have a certain number of sites that sorption can occur on, on the grains or in the organic carbon that you have in situ. Uh, once all those sites are taken by things being sorbed to them, then it has no more sorption potential. So it starts off kind of linear, but then it asymptotes to some value. So it's actually just a curve that goes over. So unlike the Freundlich isotherm, it has a, a limiting value, which is and it's just given by these two fitting parameters of alpha and beta, which define behavior. And so it's experimentally determined. Uh, it's, I guess, theoretically defined as well in terms of the number of sorption sites that are available. So what we can do is what we could do is to be, what you'd, we'd like to be able to do is we'd like to be able to use everything we've done so far about conservative species to be able to figure out how non-conservative species occur. Uh, behave, I guess. And so one way to do that is to try and replace this term with our newfound description of um, the distribution coefficient and the aqueous term. So if we substitute this into this expression um, and rearrange it by taking basically once it's written in terms of this, it comes off to the left-hand side and gets added onto this. And so this is that term here. And if we do some manipulation straightforwardly we end up with a new expression which has this extra term on the left hand side it was originally just one and now it's a factor which is multiplied by that it's basically this factor multiplied by the distribution coefficient and uh, so it gives us a new advection dispersion equation which is uh, defined with one extra term and Typically, we refer this term, it's, it's always going to be greater than 1, because it's 1 plus some physical magnitude, which is always 0 or greater or greater than 1. And it relates to the values of dispersion and advective velocity we had before. And so what we could do is we could just divide both sides through by this retardation factor. This is, this is called a retardation factor, 1 plus this term. And if we divide everything through by that, we end up with this new expression, which is this. So the new expression, bottom line, is that we end up with exactly the same advection dispersion equation we had before, except we have parameters which are modified. They're modified in that the velocity, advective velocity, is divided through by retardation factor. If it's conservative, then r is equal to 1. And this term just ends up being the advective velocity. If it's conservative, r is equal to 1. And this ends up just being the dispersion coefficient, you know, unadulterated, as it was before. And if it's uh, non-conservative, so in other words, either retarded or attenuated, then our retardation is greater than 1. And so, so the advantages of that are that hopefully it allows us to use everything we've done before to be able to understand exactly what the, the behavior would be. So in other words, the same expressions that we had before. And all we're going to do is we're going to modify them by the fact that we'll uh, modify the terms that we've used before uh, by some factor. Um, and so what does that physically mean in terms of what do we expect uh, intuitively that would happen to this? Well, if we have... A, conserv a conservative, a uh, non-conservative species rather, then this term is going to be less than it would be if it was conservative. And so it's going to be reduced. And so if you think about a system where you had um, 
a conservative system that after some time, time equals t, it looked like this. So this is conservative. Then you might expect two things. One is that if r is greater than 1, it's not going to travel so far. And so this 50% concentration point, which is where we think the, the center of mass change of the front would be, would not be here, but it would be back some point here. And so this length, we know this isn't quite true, but uh, let's ignore that for now. The length traveled is just the advective velocity times time. The actual length traveled, if it's uh, attenuated or retarded, would be this velocity divided by retardation. Would be in that ratio because it's going at some velocity less than that. And the other thing I guess that we'd expect is that if retardation is greater than one, then it's going to also reduce this term. And so, in, since we think that the amount that this is canted over is um, indicative of retardation, so if it's if it's plug flow, if retardation, sorry, if di if dispersion is zero, the front would just be vertical moving through. Uh, but if the value of this term increases, it will be canted over. And so if we're dividing this through by a number greater than 1, then it would actually reduce this. And so the interesting thing is that it would also self-sharpen the front. And so this front, surprisingly maybe, you perhaps think it would be even more dispersed, this front is actually both delayed, it's further back in the aquifer, but it's also sharper than it would be otherwise. So it's sometimes referred to as a, a self-sharpening front because of this. I suppose we could also do things to look at the values of our um, other parameters. We talked about the Peclet number, which is the advect, and which so in other words, we can often define these curves in terms of these two important parameters. Peclet number, which you remember is the ratio of advective to dispersive or diffusive fluxes, a dimensionless number. And it's equal to the advective velocity times length over dispersion. And so that's how it was for the conservative case. I guess if you wanted to write it for the non-conservative case, this is really our effective, I guess we could talk about this as being our effective advective velocity. And this is our effective dispersion right? in these. And they take account for all eventualities, right? Because if retardation is equal to 1, then it, they just revert to the normal ones. So if we substitute here for the advective, effective advective velocity and the effective dispersion, both of these are divided by uh, retardation, so nothing changes. So it doesn't change the Peclet number. But it does change the pore volumes. So this is pore volumes. It was what? It was a velocity times uh, length over a length, was that right? Velocity times time over a length. It's advective velocity or effective advective velocity. And so if we combine it with this value here, then this would turn out to be the actual advective velocity, not the effective one, times time divided by retardation and length. So in other words, this, this term here has just given us these two terms here. So it affects pore volumes, but it doesn't really affect the Peclet number. So the Peclet number would change, which is interesting, kind of perhaps not what you think. But what it does mean is that it would give you a pore volume which would be reduced over the real one. And that's really what you're seeing here. This is actually this, this is really the pore volume term here, right, divided through by retardation. So in other words, the fact that this is always greater, equal to or greater than one, means that it would be lagging behind the true location of the unretarded uh, unretarded frame. And so that's great, because what it allows us to basically do is to be able to use everything we've used before about understanding these expressions and what they, they look like. And what they look like is in terms of um, these ex two, two expressions that are, we've dragged from Fetter. One for the case where the upstream injection behavior is this delta function. So this is time versus concentration. So in other words, when we turn it on like this and turn it off, this is the, the pulse that hovers around a retardation value of 1 or a pore volume of 1. And this is the, the snatch. Um, yeah, this is the, the behavior as it comes out of the aquifer as a function of time.
versus concentration. And so we haven't talked too much about that, but but that is basically flow within the, um, a sample where it's this delta function. And the other one that we talked about, which is also comes out of um, Feder, is this expression here. And that is that concentration, again, varies around this one pore volume mark. This is this 50% concentration and one pore volume. It's true for a Peclet number of infinity. It's pretty true for a Peclet number of 100. It's less true for a Peclet number of 10. And it's really not very true for a Peclet number of 1. So we can use these expressions that we've had before. All we have to do is use a corrected pore volume and a corrected Peclet number, actually not a corrected Peclet number, to be able to represent those behaviors. And everything we've done before uh, just maps over just perfectly. And so that's uh, our interest in being able to understand it in this very straightforward way. Okay. So that says something about how we'd expect um, behavior to occur. And it's really just based on the fact that we can describe things as sorptive uh, behavior. Uh, so let's look at what that would mean for us uh, in reality. And so this are some experiments, uh, field experiments we talked about. So we talked about when we want to measure these <coughs> properties of dispersion in the field, what we could do is we could take samples and measure it. Not very good because it's not very representative of the, the large-scale structure of the aquifer. We could do experiments where you pump stuff in and pump stuff out from push-pull tests or through dipole tracer tests, but those aren't very good either because of the uh, dispersion that gets added by the, the flow regime that we set up. Or we could do natural uh, gradient tracer tests. And we looked at one where, in particular for a conservative species, the uh, plume, as it went down gradient, started off at day one being here. At uh, 85 days was here. At a year and a half was here, and at almost two years was here. Uh, and so we could do something, if we know the center of mass of these plumes, if we know the length of these plumes, it allowed us to say something about um, the dispersion coefficients, because this is a, a Gaussian distribution, and we could use this uh, measured length here, actually in the field, to be able to say something about the dispersion magnitude. And we went through that exercise. But what if instead of doing this, uh, we injected a cocktail uh, here that wasn't just a chloride plume, but also included some other components that might behave differently because they sorb differently onto the, the solid surface. And so that is exactly what this behavior is here. Uh, and so you could think about the same, inj same injection of carbon tetrachloride injected at 0 0.00, after 16 days, a year and a bit, almost two years, it goes down gradient. If we looked at PCE, tetrachloroethylene, same injection point, same time, all co-injected. Co after 16 days, after a year, and after almost two years. And you see a couple of things. This hasn't traveled as far down gradient as this. Um, the spread of it are, are different in both cases. And if you can pair it with the chloride plume, actually this one overlays all of the three together. So this is after almost three, three years, two years, sorry. This is what tetrachloroethylene looks like. This is what carbon tet looks like. And this is what uh, an un, uh, unretarded conservative component looks like. These are both non-conservative, but they're non-conservative to different degrees. Presumably because they have different magnitudes of this um, distribution coefficient, Kd. And so we can use that to be able to say something about our, our system. And so what would we want to say? Well, I suppose what we might like to do from the field experiments is be able to say something about what this retardation coefficient would be. And so presumably we can do that from looking at just the velocities, the effective velocities of these things going down gradient. And so, by definition, we can define retardation as, if you like, it would be um, the velocity of um, the unretarded case, where r is equal to 1, versus the advective velocity of r greater than 1. So this is the same as um, conservative, 
over unconservative. Bad writing, but you get the idea. And so if you do that, then I guess this expression is exactly that at the bottom of this page. And so if you write these as the ratios of, of both of those, the velocity of the conservative chloride tracer, the advective velocity of the non-conservative, well, by definition, velocity is just the length traveled in a given time of the conservative species, and it's the length traveled over time of the non-conservative species. And so since you sample them both at the same time, then it's just the ratios of these lengths. And so what we can simply do is we want to get retardation magnitude out of here. We just take this length here, which is 57 meters, and we divide it through by 23.5. So 57 over 23.5. So that would be, I guess, 47. So it's about 2 point something. 2.2 is it? I think it's 2.3 from what I've seen elsewhere. And so this is just the magnitude of that retardation. It's nothing more than that. It allows us simply to be able to define that. And if we do that, I guess it's not 2.3, it's actually 2.42 if you do the math properly. And if you do it, so that's for carbon tetrachloride. If you do it for tetrachloroethylene, the distance traveled in that particular case is only 13 meters. So it'd be 57 divided by 13, which I guess is a little more than 4. It comes out to be this. And so since we know um, where these components have got to in this given time, we can immediately get the value of retardation. We know that one is more heavily retarded than the other. PCE is more heavily retarded than the other. And I guess the other thing we could also know is that if we know that this magnitude of retardation is equal to this parameter of 1 plus uh, bulk density, divided by volumetric moisture content multiplied by KD, distribution coefficient, just that's our definition of retardation. Then what we could do is we could just rearrange this to be able to figure out exactly what this distribution coefficient is. And you remember uh, what that physically meant was that if we took, took a, a beaker full of sand and you plot the concentration of the solute on the sand relative to the amount that's in aqueous solution, we end up with this curve here, which is just, this would be concentration on the solid. This is the concentration in the liquid. And by definition, if I remind myself, this is going to be uh, C star over C. And so this would be, um, that's the case, this is going to be, I think, 1, and this would be KD. So it's just the magnitude. So in other words, if we know what this is, we can probably take a pretty good guess at what the density of the aquifer is. Typical density of an aquifer might be 2,000 uh, kilograms per meter cubed. Not an unusual volumetric moisture content, or if it's saturated, this would be the porosity, and not an unusual porosity would be 30%. So that's a number that's reasonably well constrained, and I think that's exactly what's going on on the page slightly below it, if I make it a bit smaller. So if you take the density of an aquifer to be something over 2,000 kilograms per cubic meter, if you then look at this term here, it doesn't vary very much. It's going to be something like 2 kilograms per liter. Uh, and the value of porosity is something of the order of 0.3. So it turns out to be something like 0 0.15 liters per kilogram for this overall term. And this, is a, this by definition, is a non-dimensional number, right? This was between 2 and 4 for our particular case. And so what you could do is you could rearrange this expression to be able to get a magnitude of KD out of it, which is just this. And you'd calculate that by just substituting in the values that we have. We have a value of this um, porosity divided by density. We have R minus 1, which we have from our values of this here. And if we put those in, we get values of KD to come out of it, which 
we might need or might not need, we may not need them, right? Because if we know what retardation is, this is the only term that turns up in our differential equation. So if we know what the value of r is to go into these expressions here, we actually don't need, really need to break it down to kd. We could do because kd is a physical property that has units, but we could also use r just as a straight parameter to be able to um, uh, index, I suppose, the, the equation or the parameters that go into this expression. So that allows us to be able to make predictions. So you see some pretty obvious things is that if it's retarded, then it goes slower. Uh, the ratio of the velocities by which it goes more slowly is really the definition of retardation in the physical sense. Uh, and it just means that it'll take longer to go down gradient. And the other consequence, the surprising one maybe, is that as a result of having this lag, because it goes more slowly, is that the front actually also self-sharpens, which I think is kind of a, a curiosity that uh, is perhaps not completely expected. And we do all kinds of manipulations with these things, which I don't think we, uh, we need to do. And so that's basically our discussion of retardation. So we entered this discussion by saying there are, are two things. There's uh, adsorption and absorption. Adsorption is where things are attached to the grains, and that's pretty much what's going on here. This is a happens to be a, a sand aquifer where it's really just uh, mainly quartz, maybe a bit of organics, but mainly sand. And that material gets attached to the surfaces of these grains, not onto the interior of them. If you look at other cases where you have uh, absorption, then the process is one that kind of looks a bit like adsorption, but its effects are the same, but it's actually a different process. And so this kind of illustrates that. So this is, uh, if you take some fractured rock, fractured rock has a fracture in it, at which you're pumping, pump water is flowing through. You start off the concentration upstream, and you look at a snapshot in time as to what that looks like. If it's going only in the rock, and there's no sorption occurring onto the fractures on either side of the flow, regime, flow zone, then you'd expect the concentration to be uh, unit con relative concentration upstream. And if it was plug flow, it'd just be a, a sharp step. And ahead of this step, it would be zero concentration. So this is the case where there's no sorption whatsoever. If you have no sorption, but it, instead of having something which is completely impermeable, say granite, which is the permeability of this desk, if you like, so nothing goes into it, but you take a, a porous sandstone. So now there's water filling all the pores in here. So now when this um, solute-laden plume comes through here, it can also diffuse in the water, which is present in the pores, and just diffuse into that like it would do in a beaker. And so if you looked at the distribution of the aqueous concentration front, it would have penetrated out of the fracture into the um, surrounding porous medium. If you're losing solute from the fracture into the surrounding medium, then by definition, the concentration in the fracture has to have gone down because it's gone somewhere else. And so the concentration, instead of being high as it was before, is reduced because it's gone into the fracture, so it's been pulled down. And also because it's been taken into the fracture, it's also removed the amount, and it's also pulled back the front some amount because it can't go as far because it's being basically sorbed. It's not being sorbed, but the effect is one that it's being removed from this flow regime in the fracture alone. So now if you add on top of this the fact that the stuff that goes into the um, aqueous concentration here not only goes into the pore space, but then gets sorbed onto the grains which it's surrounded by, then the concentration, the front would have gone less far than it would have here because it's been retarded, sorbed. And so now it would have gone less far, but also it would have sorbed some of it onto the solid grains. So you'd expect this, again, to have traveled even less far. It's more, the lag is larger, and the concentration is, is removed, uh, reduced even further because it's being sorbed onto the grains as well. And so if you looked at this behavior here, it's not very different than looking at the result that you have here. Instead of going this far, it has actually gone this far. And it's only gone this far by two, two different mechanisms, if you like. One by uh, absorption, if you like, by flowing into the, the 
pore space, which is water filled, and diffusing into it, which is something which is similar to absorption with a B. And in this case, in addition to that, not only is it being absorbed in the water, but it's being sorbed onto the grains that it comes in contact and plastered onto the front. So both conditions tend to, to give a lag or a retardation to the, the progress of the front. And so, uh, so there are a variety of, and, and don't care about these equations at the bottom, so there are a variety of mechanisms that uh, give you that same behavior. So just like dispersion and diffusion, they look the same. They're quite different processes in some respects. Um, but we can characterize them really by a single parameter if we want to in overview. That parameter is something called the distribution coefficient. Sometimes we, if we wish to, we can measure that distribution coefficient directly by doing an experiment in the lab to be able to get just the, to put an aqueous solution in contact with a pristine sand, measure the change in concentration on the solid, double the concentration in the aqueous form, see what happens to the concentration on the solid, and we get a relationship. It may be a straight line relationship, in which case this is relatively straightforward. It may be a curved relationship for lots of different reasons we've talked about, such as running out of um, sorption sites, and this would define the, the parameter that would go into this, which we could then use to calculate the retardation factor, which we could then use to calculate what transport would look like as you go down gradient. The alternative is you could measure the behavior in the field in terms of how far the plume should have gone, sorry, how far the plume should have gone versus how far it actually went. Look at the ratio of those distances, which is really just the ratio of the advective, effective advective velocities. And if you know those, by definition, you have a retardation factor. If you have a retardation factor, you have everything you need to be able to use in this expression to be able to project behavior into the future. You only need this value, you don't need KD, and you could go ahead and do that. If as a curiosity you want to calculate this magnitude of KD, then you just rearrange this expression here, which is what we've done, uh, to get the value of KD, and you get the value out of it, and that's it. And so that allows us to be able to straightforwardly be able to define be the behaviors that we see in reality, which are the real materials that aren't uh, inert with the surroundings that surround them, uh, are sorbed or retarded in some way, and we, we know how to deal with that. And it follows on directly from what we've talked about in terms of the behavior for um, conserved species. And so what we'll spend our time doing no next time is, uh, so this is a new heading actually that I've added into this, to, to split this into two parts, is to figure out how we can do it when we don't have any information in the field. So if we want to be able to calculate what KD is, to calculate what the retardation factor is, and we don't want to do an experiment where we put dissolved components in contact with portions of the aquifer, are the methods that we can use to be able to figure out exactly what that is just by knowing what those individual organic compounds would be uh, and something about our aquifer in terms of critical things about the sorption characteristics. And the critical thing about the sorption characteristics is often that if you have a small amount of organic carbon present in, um, in your aquifer, as you would do in a shallow aquifer, and commonly these are shallow problems, not always, then if you know the amount of organic carbon you have, you can directly evaluate what KD is based on some, a couple of simple, very simple recipes, which Feta goes through in his, his text. And that's what we'll do with next time.